Greetings, everyone. Um, Oaxaca with Keem Figueroa coming to you from LA, LA, California. And today we're going to go over fine art history in the 20th century. Actually, it's post war till now, to be more precise. All right, so I went and dug up my old uh, textbooks from a few classes. I, my degree is in illustration and stuff. All right. We're going to primarily be using this book, uh, After Modern Art, David Hopkins. Look at this motherfucker. See this guy? Yeah, we'll talk about him. You see, there's a post-it note there. My past self had done a lot of work for me I forgot about. When I decided to want to do this video, I dug it up. I dug this book up, and I um, labeled uber examples of major movements going up to 2000s and the post-modern era which really, really kind of started in the 80s for art, okay? So, I'm gonna go through this stuff. Well, I think I'm just gonna read the captions. I did mark some other stuff, but we'll see. I'm not, I'm not gonna try to uh, speak extemporaneously too much, but at the end, I'll give you the key to understanding all this shit, because it's probably gonna get a little confusing, okay? Now, we're starting the post-war era. We'll start with Jackson Pollock, an abstract expressionist. There's an abstract expressionist movement. Part of the reason why this starts after Second World War is because that's when uh, the movement goes over upon to America. Most of the shit that was happening before that was like France and some England, some German. A lot of France um, in the 19th century. Uh, so, Jackson Pollock. Abstract Expressionism, 1940s. Um, here's a caption, and this is called Full Fathom Five from 1947. This comparatively small canvas was one of the first which Pollock used his drip painting technique. Given that his canvas was placed horizontally, the title, an allusion to Shakespeare's The Tempest, Full Fathom Five by Father Lies, conveys a sense of the image containing hidden depths as does the incorporation of enigmatic foreign bodies, keys, etc., among the skins of paint. Skeins of paint, I don't know. Sounds pretty high-minded. Kind of like Pollock, actually. But Pollock only needed to be done once. Nobody needs to copy Pollock anymore, okay? He thought of that concept. Um, there's other abstract expressionists, like Mark Rothko. This one is called Untitled 1951. In Rothko's abstractions, the bounds of physical contingency were evacuated in favor of a glimpse of impersonal cosmic imperatives. The scale of the works was calculated so that spectators could measure their physical size against the colored masses. This could lead to the feeling of being enveloped or transported out of the body. Okay. Moving on, moving on. Uh, abstract expressionism got passe pretty quick. Here's a name to remember. Clement Greenberg. Clement Greenberg was the author who championed abstract expressionism as like the next step in the um, continuing lineage. Abstract Expressionism was the first big American um, movement that was like considered legit enough to get its mention and and spawned um, a whole bunch of other movements afterwards. Okay, we got a guy named Marcel Duchamp. The bride stripped bare by her bachelors, even um, the large glass in uh, parentheses, 1915 through 23. Damn, that took a long time. This work's technical inventiveness matches its iconographic density. It consists of two panes of glass set one above the other. The work shattered in transit in 1927 and was patiently reconstructed by Duchamp. Okay, fine. The occultist witnesses, lower right, were produced by meticulously, meticulously scraping away a section of silvering applied to that area of the glass. Elsewhere, random procedures were utilized. The positions of the nine holes representing the bachelor's shots, upper right, were determined by firing paint dip matchsticks at the work from a toy cannon. Okay. Uh, we also got to show Fountain real quick. 
Fountain's is really famous one where he took a urinal, uh, flipped it on its, uh, bended it and wrote a, a, an alias R mutt on there and he called it Fountain, okay? Deschamps, Deschamps was, he was a trickster in my opinion. He's a very smart dude. Um, and I don't think it's his fault just for making some jokes, <clears throat> kind of. But some guys that follow him take it a bit further. One of those guys was Robert Rauschenberg. This is called Bed from 1955. Critics at the time darkly remarked that Bed looked as if an ax murder had been committed in it. Rauschenberg saw it differently. His greatest fear, he once confided, was that somebody might try and crawl into it. Okay, that's... <laughs> okay, let's just let that lie there. Now I've got to talk a little bit about one of his buddies who was working in this Duchampian mode, as it were, whose name is John Cage. Cage is... He was a composer. He wasn't. A, he wasn't a visual artist. Okay. Cage had some. He liked Duchamp, and he had some Zen shit. A certain type of Zen. Okay. So Rauschenberg, the guy we just mentioned, was was taking white canvases and just like butting them together and called it like white paintings or white on white, right? Because these pictures, usually consisting of several modular white painted panels abutted together, reflect a pronounced discomfort with abstract expressionist bombast. They were passive receptors, awaiting events rather than prescribing sensations. Okay, sound interesting? So Cage responded in appropriate Zen style. His notorious four minutes, 33 seconds of late 1952 involved a concert audience being enjoined to listen to a piano piece consisting of three sections. Each section consisted of silence. Okay, I'm not gonna say anything. What do we got here next? Andy Warhol. He was part of the pop art movement. This piece is from 1966. It's called Cow Wallpaper. Warhol's wallpaper initially decorated a room at Leo Castelli's New York Gallery in April 1966. A room was devoted to his floating silver clouds, helium-filled silver pillows. Okay, I'm gonna show. I'll show a few Warhols. Warhol, in my opinion, is kind of another Duchamp. He is a trickster. You know, he did the soup cans, Campbell soup cans. He did the the Brillo boxes, and it's actually kind of incisive and kind of kind of funny. It's a commentary on pop culture. But again, what comes after, okay, we got minimalism, which I kind of like, Donald Judd, 1968, Anthony Caro, Prairie, 1967, uh, here's David Smith, this is one I marked in the book, it's called Lectern Sentinel. 1961. Smith's series of sentinel sculptures, which begun in 1956, were placed in the landscape surrounding his studio at Bolton Landing in upstate New York. Given their clear figurative associations, they appear to survey or guard the terrain. In this example, the overlapping and angling of the welded stainless steel plates brilliantly hint at the classical motif of contrapposto, whereby the body is slightly twisted through the employment of a resting and supporting leg. Okay. I have a little bit of sympathy toward minimalism. At least it's sort of trying to be kind of, you know, kind of pure and minimal is obviously something, is a term that people throw around a lot and that's when it was starting to be used. So something stuck there. Okay, moving up, <clears throat> 1974, we got Matta Clark, Gordon Matta Clark. This piece is called Splitting, 1974. This collage makes use of photographs of a project carried out by Amanda Clark in Inglewood, New Jersey, which involved him splitting apart a house that was due for demolition. Having divided the house in half and making two parallel cuts through it and removing the intervening section, Amanda Clark then split it by removing part of the foundations on one side and tilting that half of the building backwards. Okay, so this is sort of interesting, right? I don't know, it's kind of like a dollhouse. I'm, I'm tempted to try to explain this shit, but I'll explain 
but I won't. And uh, I'm just gonna let you see this shit and then I'm gonna give you the key to understanding all of this later on. Okay, a year later, 1975. We're getting into performance art, okay? That's a term that's known today. So we got many things going on at the same time. There's also a movement called Fluxus, which is a type of performance art. That was what Yoko Ono was doing in the 70s, and I think maybe in the 60s. Um, that might predate this proper performance art like movement by a bit, but okay. Here we have Interior Scroll Performance 1975 by Carolee Schneeman. <laughs> You're gonna like this one. The performance work for which Schneeman first rose to prominence was Meat Joy. I'm, I'm really glad there's not a picture of this. A 60 to 80 minute piece, 60 to 80 minute piece of 1964, oh, this is like more than a decade before, which, although elaborately scripted, had something of the character of an orgy, something of it, with its male and female semi-naked participants writhing on the floor manipulating raw fish, dead chickens, wet paint, and ropes. Okay, hour and 20 minutes of that. Schneeman, Later, interior scroll was still highly sexualized. Schneeman likened the scroll she removed from her vagina as an uncoiling serpent. Let's keep going. 1983, Jenny Holzer, postmodernism. Abuse of power comes as no surprise. T-shirt modeled by Lady Pink, 1983. Holzer used a diversity of means to disseminate her messages. These have included posters, plaques on buildings, t-shirts, bus tickets, park benches, baggage carousels at airports, LED screens in shopping malls or sports stadiums, television, radio, and billboards. In 1989, her slogans and statements appeared on LED strips following the circular motion of the spiral ramp at New York's Guggenheim Museum. Okay, a lot of other examples of postmodernism. Here's one from 1991. Helen Chadwick, Loop My Loop. In the decade before her premature death in 1996, Chadwick developed an iconography which has links with the thought of Georges Batier discussed in chapters one and three. In Nostalgie de la Boule, some shit, two rounded cybochrome transparencies were hung one above the other. The top one contained a ring of earthworms the bottom, someone's scalp, its center imploding so that it vaguely resembled an anus. Distinctions of holding the human above the animal or insectoid no longer held. However, <laughs> Chadwick made such transgressions playful, celebratory. Okay, that look at this. That is looks like a lot of fun. Good shit. Good job, bitch. Into the 90s. And we're gonna get to the brother on the cover. Oh, I gotta show you this shit. Um, this is Sarah Lucas. It's called Ah Naturel, 1994. Lucas grew up in a working class environment in East London and uses its idioms in her work. To some extent, she has also borrowed from the American art that she saw in the late 1980s in London's Saatchi Gallery. Her grungy, abject imagery partly echoes artists like Robert Gober and Mike Kelly. However, there is a distinct post-feminist sensibility in her art. Rather than assume a politicized stance, she often appears to ape the laddish personas of some of her male peers. This was particularly evident when, in 1993, she ran a shop in Bethnal Green with her fellow artist Tracy Emen. Amongst the merchandise she offered were t-shirts emblazoned with sexual repartee. All right, now, this is the last two pages of the book. We got this motherfucker again, look at this shit. This is fucking weird shit. 